This is All India Radio. In the program Spotlight, now we bring you a discussion on developments in Sri Lanka. The participants are Ashok Sajjanhar, former diplomat, and Manish Anand, journalist. Sri Lanka has plunged in an unprecedented political crisis, which was caused by another unprecedented economic crisis. President Gotabaya Rajpaksha has fled and has committed to resign from his position. Now that the all-party meeting has taken place and the Prime Minister, Ranil Vikram Singh has also resigned on the basis of the outcome of the all-party meeting. Now the stage is set for the formation of an all-party government and the world is looking at the Sri Lanka for political stability to begin repairing its economic damage. Ambassador Sajjan Ha, political stability is the bare minimum requirement, I suppose, for the multilateral agencies to begin talking to Sri Lanka again. How do you see the roadmap ahead? Yes, you're very right, Manish, that first Sri Lanka has to get its political act together and only after that, will able to get the economy on track. It is a great tragedy in terms of what is happening in Sri Lanka because Sri Lanka is a middle-income country. Literacy rates are very high. People are educated. People are technically qualified and trained. And for that country to come to this pass within a space of about three years, that is totally unprecedented and highly regrettable. Of course, there are a number of reasons, both international, geopolitical, as well as, most importantly, the role of the president and his clan, his brothers. Also, the role that China has played as far as its support to some of the unviable, uneconomic projects in the country are concerned. But your question about the way forward is very important at this stage because the people, the leadership, and the world over people are looking at as to what is happening in Sri Lanka. So yesterday at the all-party meeting that was held, it was decided that both Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe as well as the President Gotabaya Rajpaksa, both of them would be asked to leave their offices, although Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe did object to this to begin with because he has been in office just for about two months or so, and he has not really had any role to play whatsoever in the country coming to such a sorry pass. But uh, then it was thought that the new all-party government would like to start on a fresh slate. So he has also agreed to go. And the Speaker of the Parliament will be the new interim president for the next one month or so, during which a regular president would be elected. But I think the ball really would be in the court of the all-party government and who would take measures in terms of getting support and assistance from the IMF, getting support from international agencies as also Other partners of Sri Lanka, like India, has gone out of its way to support Sri Lanka and many other countries. But before all of that comes, it would also be necessary to bring in political stability and to urge the thousands of protesters who have come from all over the country and who have congregated in Colombo, that they should go back and they should give an opportunity to this new all-party government to put the house in order and to resolve the crisis that confronts Sri Lanka at this stage. Ambassador Sajinhar, we are reminded of the events which unfolded on May 4, 1998 in Indonesia when President Suharto was there and for a month violence and damages to the properties which took place there in that country. That was again on the basis of very dictatorial side sort of government out there. But fortunately, we are not seeing a repeat of those sort of incidents in Sri Lanka. People are much restrained. Do you appreciate the conduct of the people so far in Sri Lanka? Yes, I think it is commendable because so far it has been by and large a peaceful protest. The protests have been going on for more than 90 days now and every day thousands of protesters have come and they have collected in the central part of Colombo in Golface and they have been protesting, they have been asking the Rajapaksa brothers to go. We saw the Prime Minister, the elder brother of the President, he left his post on the 9th of May and at that time there was a little bit of violence and destruction of property but that was really instigated by the followers of the Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa and after that again it became peaceful, there was no major violence that could be seen. It was only day before yesterday that things really got out of hand 
There was a call that had been given by a number of groups and uh, political organizations for people to collect in uh, Colombo to protest against the continuation of Gotabaya Rajpaksa, the president. And uh, sensing that there was bound to be trouble as a result of the very difficult economic situation in the country, Gotabaya Rajpaksa also appears to have fled on the evening of Friday and his whereabouts are still not known. It is regrettable that the personal house of the Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe, that was burnt down. And this is, I think, a sign of the anger and the desperation and the frustration of the protesters. But this was, I think, the only aberration that has taken place. While otherwise, for most part, by and large, the protests have been peaceful. But now I think to redeem themselves, the protesters should go back peacefully, go back to their homes. And the new government, as soon as it is established, the all-party government, they should work in terms of getting some immediate relief for the people. I think one complicating factor here is that although Ranil Vikramasinghe has said that he is willing to resign right away, the president still maintains that he is going to resign only on the 13th. Now, I'm really not able to comprehend what is the sanctity or relevance or significance of 13th of July. If he knows that the whole country is against him, they have come out in thousands to protest against him, his brothers, his family, his clan, his policies. I think it behooves upon him that he should tender his resignation right away. In fact, Gotabaya Rajpaksa should have tendered his resignation several months ago, but he just wanted to hang on to the position of power and authority. And uh, that has been, unfortunately, to the detriment of the country. And it has not helped him also. If he had resigned and gone out of the scene, the manner in which Gotabaya Rajpakse has fled reminds me of the manner in which Imran Khan was thrown out just a few months ago because it was quite clear that he had lost the majority in the parliament. But he also stuck on to his position and he tried all types of machinations through the deputy speaker and all the others to stick to his position of power. But then ultimately he also had to go and uh, Gotabaya Rajpakse had to unfortunately go in very difficult and unsavory circumstances. Indeed, Ambassador Fajinhar. But we also look back and see that China had a clear strategy to encircle India in the Arabian Sea, in the Indian Ocean and the Bay of Bengal. The way they trapped Nepal, Maldives, Sri Lanka, Pakistan in their date trap. So now can we say that the Chinese date trap policy in the Indian subcontinent has failed and the neighboring countries should draw a convincing lesson for future? I think this should be quite clear not only to India's neighbors, not only to the countries in South Asia, but I think around the world where the Belt and Road Initiative is being taken forward. I don't know what the exact count is, but the Chinese authorities seem to mention that there are more than 60 or 70 countries that are engaged with China and they are not only in Southeast Asia, not only in South Asia, but also in Africa and go as far as South America and even Europe. So I think this should really be a wake-up call. This should be a warning sign for all countries that this is what China's debt trap can lead countries into. And in the case of uh, Sri Lanka, what has happened is that as far as the Hamman Tuta port is concerned, you are right when you say that it is China's strategy of constructing a string of pearls around India. So they have the Gwadar port in Pakistan. They wanted to have something in Maldives, Hamman Tota in Sri Lanka, Chakfu in Myanmar, Djibouti out there in the West. In Djibouti, they have all these bases and they wanted to encircle India so that India would not be able to play its due role as far as global affairs, regional affairs, international affairs are concerned. And this is what has happened as far as Sri Lanka is concerned. It is, as I mentioned earlier, it's a middle income country, it's a prosperous country. But because of the debt trap from China, they have been reduced to this stage. And I think the situation as far as Pakistan is concerned is also not far away. And similarly, what I can foresee is that in Nepal also, the way China has been coming in, creating its 
Belt and Road projects there, that Nepal would also get highly indebted to China and then it will have a problem. India, of course, has stood by Sri Lanka in a very strong way. We have provided about $3.8 billion worth of assistance to Sri Lanka over a period of six months. I think it would be useful to remember that India had invested in Afghanistan about $3 billion over 2021 years. So here, India's uh, contribution and India's role has been huge, has been enormous. And in every area that Sri Lanka has felt the need and uh, requirement, whether it is petrol, it is kerosene, it is diesel, or it is food, medicines, in every area, food, health, energy, security, India has come in and also provided funding for loans, for credit lines, for credit swaps. So India has emerged as a very significant and strong partner and a friend under India's neighborhood first policy and under our policy of Vasudheva Kutumbakam. But China has not even agreed to restructure its debt. And this, you know, when you started the program with this, that this would be the first requirement of the IMF and of the international lending agencies that this needs to be done. Whatever debts they have, it needs to be restructured. So I think this should really, China's attitude and behavior in Sri Lanka should really serve as a wake-up call for all countries around the world who have been so proactively engaging with China in its Belt and Road Initiative projects. Indeed, Ambassador Sajjan Hawa, you have rightly said that India has been quite seen in timely making intervention with financial aid and uh, line of credit for Sri Lanka. But uh, what we see very regretfully is that the developed countries are seen wanted. They appear to be least concerned. Billions of dollars are being poured in Ukraine, but they are hardly showing any sort of concern for big humanitarian crisis which is in the making in Sri Lanka. So how do we go ahead and do you think India should take initiative and get the big developed countries on board to make intervention in Sri Lanka. The developed countries have really ignored what has been happening here because I guess if there is protest and there are demonstrations, this is how, and these uh, protests are peaceful and they did not pay much attention to it and their all their attention has been focused on Ukraine. But uh, now I think what has happened started happening from Saturday over the last two, three days. I think now the developed countries will definitely wake up to the situation. You know, this is something similar, in fact, to what to use external affairs minister Dr. Jashankar's phrase that the developed world threw Afghanistan under the bus and they did not really care about it, bother about it in August 2021 when the change of the government took over and rather when the Taliban captured the power on the 15th of August last year. So here also it seems to be that the developed world so far has been completely ignoring what has been happening here. But India, I'm certain, is in touch with our friends and partners, whether it is the United States, it is Europe, it is Japan. And this Sri Lanka is an extremely important country as far as the Indo-Pacific is concerned. So I'm certain that stability and security and peace and tranquility in this country is important for all the Quad countries and all the other countries who want that there should be, and it falls on the sea lanes of communication, very strategic sea lanes of communication. So I'm sure that all these countries will also come together and IMF and other multilateral lending agencies will also come together to ensure that the immediate relief and help is provided to Sri Lanka and also going forward that there is an appropriate relief package that comes up through the IMF which can see Sri Lanka coming on its feet very quickly. Ambassador Sajjan Ha, you have shared your insight with us. Thank you so much for talking to the All India Radio. Thank you very much. You were listening to a discussion on developments in Sri Lanka. The participants were Ashok Sajjanhar, former diplomat, and Manish Anand, journalist. This program was produced and presented by the News Services Division of All India Radio. You can listen to it on our mobile app, News on AIR. This program is also available on our YouTube channel, News on AIR Official. You may email your opinion about this program at airnsdtalks at gmail.com.